Can everybody hear me if I just talk loud instead of using the microphone? Is that everybody? Okay, good. I might just do that. I'm kind of a loud mouth sometimes, at least some people say. So um, welcome back. And I say welcome back, no, number one, because this is the third of the speaker series. But number two, this is the second time we're talking about the Douglas McChristian collection. Uh, we had the, the first program a couple of years ago. Of course, COVID stopped the programming last year. Uh, but we discussed heavily last time some of the uniforms and a little bit of the equipment and just bits and pieces of the collection. Uh, but we're going to just keep going with it. I, we could do 50 talks and really just keep talking about new things every day. Yes, it, uh, they just put me down for September. I'll give another talk because there's just so much to this. We are very thankful and very blessed that we were able to acquire the Douglas McChristian collection. And as you can see up on the board there, that is Doug McChristian in his uh, park ranger uniform given one of his wonderful speeches. Uh, he lived life history, uh, was a living historian, he trained people, he wrote, an author. Uh, there's just so much that he did for historical preservation and education. So, the collection actually encompasses 1,630 pieces. When we got the information that Doug was thinking about letting Fort Concho acquire this, we got this inventory right here. And the inventory is only about 700 pieces. And so we were excited for that. Going through this inventory, you will see that there are quite a few pieces that are very rare, maybe one of a kinds. Uh, many pieces are duplicated, but even the duplicates are different one way or another from the others. So we were excited just seeing this. And it's always, if you want to know the proper information, you go to the source. And it's usually the person who writes the book on it, right? You go to the person who wrote the book on it. And he wrote the book on it. So he wrote two books. This is a two-volume set and one right here. And this is about uniforms, weapons, and equipment for the Indian Wars era, for the enlisted men specifically, a little bit about officers, but more for the enlisted men. And so he goes through and he chronicles and he studies and he talks about why uniforms would change and the different variations and the very different types of items that they carried with them. And in and all that, he would include photographs. Well, the photographs are actually these pieces here. So he collected all of this stuff in his lifetime and utilized all of that to write the book about it. So when we talk about the variations of a uh, campaign belt, for example, the Type 1, the Type 2, the Type 3, it's really Doug who laid all that out. Uh, he collected all that, but he had a mind for collecting that he was going to try to get a little bit of everything and all the variations of it. Now, there are a few limitations to the collection because there's just no way he could acquire everything because some things are so rare, there's only one or two or maybe three in existence. For example, this right here. And I thought I was going to trick you and say it's an original and put it on and then drop it on the floor and everybody gasped because I just dropped a $20,000 jacket. But I decided not to give you heartbreak and heartburn. But this is what is considered the 1872 pleated blouse. And Doug wanted one of these, I can guarantee you, but there's only just a couple that are in existence, one at the Smithsonian and I think one at Little Bighorn. And that's it. They are just not out there anywhere. The soldiers despised this jacket because it had the pleats, it didn't fit right, it was just odd looking wearing it, and they didn't really like it. So a lot of it was probably junked afterward. Sold off junk, somebody wore it as a civilian because they found it at a, at a fire sale, uh, but he wasn't able to acquire one of these, so what did he do? He made a museum quality reproduction. So I can actually wear this one. I can put it on and wear it. But everything else, except for just a couple of pieces, he found and was able to find some wonderful pieces that are identified to particular soldiers, identified to particular units. So 1,630 uniform pieces, equipment, documents, and other items, and it was a life's work for Douglas McChristian to acquire all of this. He spent 35 years in the National Park Service, many Western historic sites, uh, would come down to Texas, and uh, I, I know a lot of the volunteers in the early 90s would go up to Fort Davis, and Doug McChristian would be the first sergeant, and he would teach them living history, and he would teach them about the uniforms and equipment. So he spent a lot of time in Texas as well. 
um, friend of Fort Concho for many years. Bob Bluthart, our director, was a close friend of him. Uh, I never got a chance to meet him, but I know of him. And I've utilized these books for a long time. So when Bob came up to me and said, well, we got a chance to acquire the Douglas McChristian collection, a little tear comes out the side of my eye because I know what's in those books. I was very excited. This is one of the largest privately owned collections in the nation. This is Smithsonian quality stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I said, some of the pieces are one of a kind, and some of the pieces you will never see anywhere else. And so we are very blessed to have that. But one of the largest privately owned collections of its kind in the nation. And it really concentrates on the enlisted men, as I said. So a lot of that type of stuff. Not only does this highlight the history of the 19th century military, but these objects honor the legacy of a recognized scholar and historian. This is Doug here. And I always like to take him with me every time I give a speech, whether it's in a PowerPoint or whether I have a photograph of him. This is Doug. This is his legacy right here, these type of things. Tragically, Doug passed away in 2018 after a long battle with illness. Um, he knew that he was going to pass, and that's why he contacted Fort Concho. Uh, why did he pick Fort Concho? Well, as I said, he was a friend of the fort. But he also knew that Fort Concho had a little bit different situation uh, as opposed to the National Park Service and maybe some state parks. He was really worried that the collection might be sent somewhere and it be split up and be sent all over the country. And he was really worried that if the National Park Service was to get this, that that's what would happen. So he knew that Fort Concho, being city of San Angelo, being run by the city of San Angelo, that we have the capability of keeping it all here in one piece. And that's what was so appealing. Not only did he like Fort Concho and the staff, but he knew that we could keep it together, and that was another reason for bringing it here. So after many months of back and forth of discussing and negotiating, um, and then his passing, unfortunately, uh, we decided that it was time to go get the collection. So. With the help of Fort Concho members, uh, the surrounding community, and the Fort Concho Foundation, we acquired the funding that it took to purchase the collection, and we went up to Arizona, to Tucson, and picked it up. So when we got to his house, of course this is the first time that I went to his home, Bob Bluthart had gone up there and had been to his house sometime, uh, a few times actually. Uh, he had everything out. He had a room added on to his house, just specifically so he could put all this stuff out and enjoy it. That's my problem. I have collectibles and most of them are in a box. How can I enjoy that? Because everything is in a box. But he made this room, separated this room out, and put everything out there. So I know it's hard to see, but you can see all the hooks, uh, cartridge boxes, uh, belts, cartridge belts right here, um, cups all up at the top right there, holsters hanging right here. He had a bed set up with uh, original framing and uh, a mattress and pillow that was original. So all of this was out and he was enjoying it, right? So this is what we came to. Uh, the 700 pieces we were expecting turned into 1,600 pretty quick. Now, what is very appealing to some of this is not only just the pieces themselves, but some of them have a direct connection to Fort Concho itself. So if you look closely at this one, you can see on it, you have some lettering and writing. 16th Infantry. And then down here you can see it's B Company with 9. And then underneath that, it actually says Recruit right there at the bottom. This particular piece is an 1870 war, 1874, excuse me, uh, Type 1 pattern of a haversack. So the soldier would carry their food items and some of their personal items in it. But this one was specifically made for a recruit. And after you were assigned a post, they would hand out some of this equipment to you and they would send you on your way. And you would make it out here to the vast regions of the frontier with your haversack and a blanket and a little bit of equipment, generally not even having your weapon yet. So you would get that and it was stamped recruit. And specifically, when you got to your assignment, you were supposed to give all that stuff up that said recruit, box it up, and send it back to the recruiting depot. Now, somehow, some way, at some point, the 16th Infantry got a hold of this and made it their own. And so that piece, because it's 16th Infantry related, more than likely was here at Fort Concho. Very excited to have pieces like that.
Uh oh. There we go. From the very big to the very small, we have boxes, we have crates, we have belts. And how about a spoon right here? Uh, a spoon was found at Fort Buford, North Dakota, is marked Company E, 8th Cavalry, on the handle. This was used by officers of the 8th, and on the reverse, it has that stamped on there. Uh, this is another piece that was probably used here at Fort Concho. If it was kept and dropped later, then it might have been here at Fort Concho because the 8th Cavalry was actually here in mass, in complete regiment. They were here in the late 1880s getting ready for their next assignment. They would amass right here at Fort Concho and then go out to the next assignment. So the vast majority of soldiers and officers of uh, the 8th Cavalry were actually here at Fort Concho. While we're talking about utensils, I thought I'd bring in a couple of cups. Cups are not too exciting, really. I mean, they're just cups. You drink out of them, right? There's a couple of cups that actually have some stamping on the bottom, some soldiers etching on the bottom where they write their name, write their initials. Sometimes it's very difficult to find the initials and who it's connected to, right? Um, but a full name and company, sometimes that's etched on there, we can find it. But here's two cups uh, that are particularly interesting. This is actually Civil War era, that particular style and design that has the wire loops the wire connectors at the top and a rivet down here. This one was dug from Fort Custer, Montana about 1990 by Douglas McChristian. And what he thinks, the reason why it has this little spout on the end is because somebody may have squished it to use it as a pour spout so that they could pour stuff in. I guess you can still use it as a drinking cup, but they wanted to use it so they could pour something. Now on the opposite side, he dug it up. So there's no telling what stepped on it over time. Uh, the pressure from the soil, who knows, it may have actually stamped it like that, but it is in bad shape. This one right here is another situation where you have a cup that has some problems with it, but you, you look at those problems, you look at those issues and think, well, what was that used for? So this one actually has, at the very tip of it right here, this part right here is knocked down somewhat. And Doug, in his notes, thinks that this was probably used at one time for digging something digging in the dirt to find whatever, digging in the dirt to make a, a rifle pit, nobody really knows. But as mundane as a cup and as basic as a cup is, that little added piece may tell a story someday. A music pouch, pattern 1885, music pouch in sling. Uh, nothing specific until this time for the men to carry their music in until this 1885 pattern right here. Uh, very beautiful. I love the colors of it and love the strap that's very decorative as well. Uh, specific things owned by a soldier, and I have this one up in the display case if you wanted to see it, along with those two cups. Uh, this is attributed to Joseph Hunting, who was actually part of B Company, 37th Infantry, and then later Company E of the 5th Infantry. And Douglas McChristian loved the 5th Infantry. That was his company, his regiment. He loved those groups in the 5th Infantry. And so he did a lot of collecting specifically for the 5th. And this is a personal piece that was attributed to Joseph Hunting. We also have a dress uniform, a dress coat that was used by Joseph Hunting. Uh, this is a common butcher knife made by J. Russell, Green River Works. And it's stamped with a floral pattern on it, as you can see, with the three stamps right here. A lot of decorative elements on it, and then the fringe that hangs down. Uh, First Sergeant Joseph Hunting served from 1867 to 1875 in the military. Remember I talked about the one-of-a-kinds? And you may have seen this one before. I like to bring it up because this is a one-of-a-kind. Uh, not only did he get McKeever boxes, which are ammunition boxes, leather boxes that would hold each separate cartridge in the loops, as you can see here. This is not just a McKeever box, this is the McKeever box. This is the one that was brought up to the ordnance board and the equipment board as a sample. And the board would look it over and say, okay, we like this about it, we don't like this about it, but they had all these samples to look over and they were going to adopt one of them. And so this is the one that they looked over, or maybe there was a couple of them that they looked over. It's actually patented June 10th of 1873 and it's got some tagging in there that make it the sample that they used. And so they adopted this, but they didn't adopt it in, in, in its entirety. 
it actually would take a couple of more years for it to come where they would have a specific 4570 cartridge box manufactured on the same style as this McKeever but this right here is a one of one or a one of two very rare to have something like this because it was the one that they sh that they showed at the uh, infantry board examinations different types of holsters from left to right Civil War model 1863 for the Colt and Remington in the center the model 1875 holster modified for the cartridge belt and these are the cartridge belts that we're referring to a lot of times though these were manufactured in different models every few years they may change it because as these belts change then you might have to get a new holster because the loop was too small or the loop didn't work right for some reason so at the very bottom the model 1881 which is the one on the right here uh, this is the first type two inch loop from March 1881 but they had five separate patterns of this because the belts just kept getting wider and wider and they'd have to make a bigger loop and a bigger loop so there were five different patterns of this that had a bigger leather loop as it continued on anybody ever heard of this term you probably heard of mercantile right a mercantile haberdashery I'm gonna be your haberdasher today so ladies and gentlemen if you're in the market for a new hat I'll be your person I'll be your haberdasher today this kind of gives you an idea of the extent of Douglas's collection so say you want something very fashionable and trendy something modeled after the French uh, something to go out in the evening you can have a forage cap uh, all of these forage caps model 1872 all of them different because they have different insignia on there if you don't like the insignia on your cap that you're going to buy I can get you different insignia because he has insignia if you like the seventh infantry well, I've got one if you like the second cab well I've got one we can give you all that you want if you don't like the caps that's fine what if you want to wear the cap in the rain how about a cover to go over the cap it's wool you want to protect it a little bit so he has one of the cap covers just a white linen cover for the pattern 72 forge cap uh, this was under contract of 1894 but you put it right on top and it would protect it you don't want one of those how about a dress helmet very fashionable right the dress helmet of the time if you look over here into the the white little small display case uh, you can see the 72 pattern dress cap for infantry this becomes the later dress helmet for infantry with the spike on the top regular armory helmet stamped with the US quartermaster stamping in it uh, it's marked CJ Heller from Philadelphia and this is about 1893 the contract the name Hayden is inscribed in black ink on the surface of the sweatband that's all Douglas needs we have now 14th we know this is the 14th infantry and we have a last name that's all Douglas needs so he was able to locate the soldier that wore this William Hayden Company F of 14th US Infantry served from 1896 to 1899 he enlisted in 1896 in Portland Oregon and was discharged at the rank of corporal in the Philippines in 1899 it's easy to find when you put just a little bit of information in there and just Hayden and knowing it's the 14th knowing it's an infantry dress helmet that was enough for Douglas to be able to figure out what soldier wore it you want something for the summer you want something to protect your ears how about a campaign hat 1890 1889 excuse me campaign hat what's special about this one is that the government decided that they were going to save just a little bit of money and instead of putting a separate vent on the side to keep your head cooler in the summer they just poked holes in it it's a lot cheaper to poke holes than to put a separate brass vent on the side so that's going to save a little money all right how about something really specifically for the summer how about a dress I mean a, a summer helmet pattern 1880 summer helmet modeled after anybody know what foreign army this is kind of modeled after the British their pith helmets right modeled after the British they got a lot of ideas from European armies and would utilize that I believe this is kind of modeled after some Swiss pleated clothes that they had that 72 blouse so this is the early pattern summer helmet and where do you think some of the first places some of the summer clothes would go to this yeah Texas New Mexico Arizona some of these places yeah that when they were sending out stuff for trials these are some of the first places that they would send some of that summer stuff to 
But what they didn't send out here was stuff for the winter. So if you need something for the winter, I got you covered as well. This is a muskrat hat. And it is pretty bad off. Muskrat must have been sick. But a muskrat hat, it has the tie, it has the flaps that come down, has a little visor on the front. It's identified inside, but unfortunately we can't find the name. Now, it's not real pretty, but functional, yes. If you don't like it, I'll throw in a pair of gloves that go with it. So how about some muskrat gauntlets? Muskrat hat, muskrat gauntlets, I'll do the two for one sale. All right, so again, a little bit of information on these pieces and Doug was able to locate these soldiers and get a little history of them. So this one right here was actually stenciled Daniel D. McCarthy on each of the palms of the gloves. And it's marked seven and stenciled at a different point D7, which leads you to believe it's 7th Cavalry, Company D. But he didn't serve in the 7th, or excuse me, he didn't serve in Company D of the 7th. He served in Company E of the 2nd, later Company F of the 7th. So I don't know the story of how he got a Company D glove because he served in Company F. But he served from 1870, and eventually he deserted in 1882. He was actually captured or surrendered in 1889. But when I did the research on what Doug had found, I found it very interesting that this individual suffered from frostbite of the fingers. So I don't know if the gloves were used at that time or not, but he had a lot of ailments. So whenever he was trying to get pension funds in 1916, he wrote, I'm the claimant in the above indicated claim and have to state that I'm not subject to any disability of service origin other than those allegedly named. Frostbite of both ears, feet, and the fingers of both hands. Deafness in both ears. And in fact, some of the soldiers that uh, were witnesses for him actually said that he really had to speak up for him to ever hear anything. That they really had to yell out to get Daniel to hear him. Uh, he also had problems with his abdomen because he was kicked by a horse at one point and stomped by a horse at one point. So he had a hard time. Um, but 1916, he was able to give that information that he was trying to get pension money, uh, but I'm wondering why he didn't utilize the gloves at that point. They said that he was almost frozen solid on horseback that when this occurred, and he was up in the, the Dakota Territory, that they actually physically had to pick him up off the horse, and he was so stiff they thought he was dead. I love the uniforms, and I brought two there. I also have one inside of the big display case. Uh, I didn't bring as much because I brought a lot last time, but let me go over a few of the uniform pieces. The first one I brought, and so what I did, my intern for this semester from Angelo State, Hannah and I, we just kind of picked a couple of boxes and said, let's see what's inside. So we picked them up and said, we're going to use those. So I picked out this one right here, the cavalry dress coat, which is a pattern 1872, but it was used by Patrick McManaman from Troop D and Troop N of 4th U.S. Cavalry. He was actually part of recruiting training, which was Troop A of the Mounted Service, and then eventually Troop E of the 5th. He served two terms in the Army from 1888 to 1898 in various units, which are laid out there. But in 1891, Matt Manaman and five other soldiers were indicted, but found not guilty for murdering a civilian in Walla Walla City, Washington. A gambler by the name of Andrew Hunt had murdered Private Emmett Miller of Troop D, 4th Cavalry, and in retaliation, McManaman and his friends went to the jail and removed him from the jail and supposedly killed him. So he was brought up on trial, and this was a civilian court, but all of the soldiers were found not guilty. He was going to be tried by court-martial, but at that time, they actually had an early discharge opportunity for these soldiers, and he took advantage of that really quick. So he got out of the military before his court-martial could come up. Civilian court found not guilty. Court-martial, who knows, he got out before that would happen. So we have the 1872 pattern dress coat, which is up there, and the 1872 pattern forage cap as well. We have that of his and one of his belts. 
And what's interesting is in all of these pieces, it's number 23. So we can assume that if we ever come across anything else that's supposedly from the 4th Cavalry Company D of that time period, if it's Mark 23, it's his. That's apparently what his soldier number was, because everything is Mark 23. This coat, though, is an 1872 pattern, and he served in the 1880s. So by that time, they had a new pattern of coat, of dress coat. What had happened, and this happened a lot of times with soldiers, you had an allowance, a clothing allowance, when you came into the military. And you would use that allowance money towards buying of some of these pieces. And so if you wanted a new coat, well, you would use some of your allowance towards this brand new coat. If this coat was one of the worst coats in the military, nobody wanted to get it, then it would cost less than the brand new coat. So you might opt to spend some of that money on the cheaper one, right? So what had happened, apparently, is this coat was not originally issued to McManaman. It was issued to another soldier who was a sergeant. Because you can see very lightly the stitching marks for the sergeant chevrons and some of the service chevrons on that dress coat. A veteran coming out of the military having that coat, he may opt to sell it. He might not need it. He may not care about, you know, I was in the military and I want to keep all my stuff. He just wants to get rid of it. So apparently he bought that coat off of a veteran, took off the chevrons, took off some of the straps in the back to make it closer to the 1880s regulations and wore it in the 1880s. And this is what was on the inside. Patrick McManaman, and then D4, number 23, upside down. And he really wanted you to know that this was his coat, and you can't really see it, but right above there is a stamp that's specifically his name. He went somewhere and actually purchased the stamp that has his full name on it, and it's in two places inside that coat. So it has stitching lines for the sergeant chevrons and at least three service stripes that were on there for the soldier that wore it beforehand. I like to call these my coffins, and I have one of my coffins here because I felt like a mortician putting these into their little coffins. I like to put them into boxes instead of hanging them because the stress that might be onto the seams over time may do some damage to the coat. So I put them into their little coffins and I work with them and I, I stuff the body and I put stuffing into the arms. I feel like a mortician doing that. But I left this one in there to show you that, and then I have a uh, winter coat over here for you to look at as well. We don't have a whole lot of officer stuff with the exception of this one right here. It's a tailor-made infantry captain's uniform. And I say tailor-made because in the 1880s, there was a real push for them to create what was called the unmade enlisted men's uniforms. And so you could buy a uniform that was not put together, not complete, for a lesser price and that way you could take that uniform to a tailor and the tailor could sew it up and make it fit to your body better because there's only four to five sizes that you had a choice of and if you got one that was unmade you could take it to the tailor and they could make it form fit perfectly to your body but somehow this officer more than likely uh, was able to purchase this uh, it does have the captain's bars on there so he eventually became a captain and he got this unmade enlisted men's blouse and he turned it into his own. And it was unmade, so he had a tailor probably do it or he did it himself. So, the two dress coats that I have over here, and I know this is long, but this is a real important thing for preservation. Those two uniform jackets are toxic, maybe. We don't know. We don't know exactly what was put into those two uniform jackets over there, those dress coats. Because there was a process at the time for mildew proofing and waterproofing some of the clothes and some of the wool material and some of the tents. And so inside some of these coats right here, you will see markings from a George, right here, if I can get my, George Coles and Company, and it will be marked on the inside of some of these coats. Well, they had an agreement with the military from 1869 to 1876, this George Coles company, to put treatment onto the material to keep it from being eaten up by the moths and for waterproofing and mildew proofing. 
but they never gave the exact recipe of what all chemicals were involved in this. And so it's kind of scary to think about it. In some of the records, though, we know that there was probably copper, zinc, and mercury put into the chemical vat. Uh, there was probably some copper, copper sulfate, which was used as a protection against mildewing. Uh, there was the chloride of zinc and bichloride of mercury, and there was uh, gelatin and glycerin for water repelling, and there was soaps that were put in there, and alm that was put in there, and all this stuff was mixed up and put into a vat. And then the people that were working at that company would go in there barefoot and put the material inside and stomp on it. Almost like you're doing the grapes, right? They would stomp on it. They were exposing themselves to the high concentrations of whatever chemicals were in there. And the military would sometimes question exactly what's in there and how safe is it. One of the officers at the time, and Doug couldn't find the exact officer that said this, had a quote about this particular company's treatment. And he says, those who alter or repair this clothing, the cow's treated clothing, complain that it is poisonous in handling and causes a burning sensation in the fingers. Now, I have touched these not knowing. I have touched these knowing. I don't think that it's going to cause a big problem, but you don't know what's inside there. You really don't. So a little bit of toxicity, maybe, who knows? I have my gloves on, they had their gloves. So we have a pair of dress gloves. So from the dress uniform, uh, in ceremony and parade, you would have your dress gloves. What was that Berlin material, that Berlin cotton material? So regulation pattern, uh, Berlin dress gloves. And if you notice on these, you actually have elastic right there so they form fit to the wrist. How about some documents? We have documents, we have books, we have photographs. This is a collection from George Wilson. George Wilson of the 9th U.S. Cavalry. But what makes it very interesting, his collection, is that he served with the 9th in seven separate enlistments from 1873 to 1903. Seven separate enlistments. So we have commissions and discharge type papers and some lettering and stuff from him and his time period. Here is his non-commissioned officer's appointment to a sergeant for Troop I, 9th U.S. Cavalry, and that was in 1888. But nine, or excuse me, seven separate enlistments. Uh, right here I was able to locate in one of the books about Buffalo Soldiers. This is our George Wilson right here. In the book it actually says his name is James Wilson, but there was no James Wilson in Troop I. It was George Wilson. So that supposedly is a photograph of him. And what these soldiers are doing right here, uh, all part of the 9th, is Edward Hatch, the colonel of the 9th, had died, and this is the escort, the honor guard. And you notice that they have their Berlin gloves on as well. Dress uniforms, dress helmets, Berlin gloves, and they were the honor guard for burial in 1889. I love the photographs. I have quite a few of them in the display case there, so I encourage you to go look, but a lot of photographs that are identified to particular soldiers. Um, some particular regiments may not know exactly who the soldier is. Uh, these are two officers, one of them Lieutenant John Bigelow, 9th and 10th Cavalry. This is probably when he was with the 10th, and you can zoom in when you have this on your computer screen to his dress helmet right there. And it actually has, it looks to me like 1-0. So this is probably when he was with the 10th, which makes it about 1882, time period circa 1882. Uh, this one right here, Gerard, Joseph Gerard, who was the regimental adjutant of the 9th. This was actually in George Wilson's group of letters and other pieces. And we don't know exactly why George had it. Maybe they were friends. Maybe he admired the man. I have no clue. But this photograph of Gerard in his West Point uniform uh, was in George Wilson's group. Beautiful photograph. You don't see many of families, Buffalo soldiers and their families, the African-American soldiers of the time. So this is a photograph of an unidentified black cavalry corporal and two women who are presumably wife and daughter. I love the look on her face, the daughter standing because she has just the slight smile, just very slight smile. You don't see many people smiling in the photographs of that era, correct? 
just a slight smile. They are in their best uh, late 1890s Victorian transition to the Edwardian period. Very wonderful clothing that the ladies have on and his uniform as well. What we don't have though is any kind of hat insignia to go off of. So Doug would have to look and see, okay, this was taken by a particular photographer. And O.S. Goff of Dickinson, North Dakota. North Dakota became a state in 1889, so at least that's a starting point. We know it's 1889 or after. Goff conducted his business in and around Dickinson during uh, the 1896 era, a few years, 1896, and was known to visit Fort Custer. Part of the 10th was posted at Fort Custer prior to the Spanish-American War. So it's very likely that this soldier is from the 10th Cavalry. On the back of the photograph is written in ink. Really, you can't read it all, but it says colored residents. And then in blue ink, it says friends of Elizabeth Proctor. I don't know if we'll ever be able to find out who was connected and who the friends were, but at least it has that on the back. This one right here is an interesting piece because this soldier in his history, he, he was a big, big fat liar. He was a deserter in the military. And he served one enlistment, and right here, so from November 8th of 1878, he was with the 3rd Cavalry and deserted March 7th of 1882. A few months later in November, he would enlist again under an assumed name. So his original name was Frank Ballantine, that's his real name, but he enlisted later on as Fritz Braun. And so Fritz Braun went to serve 26 years in the military. Through the Indian Wars era into Spanish-American War, he fought in Cuba, he was in the Philippines. We don't really know why, but why would you enlist for that short a period with the third desert, and then a few months later go back into the military for another 26 years? There could be a lot of reasons why, and we may never know. Something may have happened, he may have been you know, wanted for something, wanted civilian life, wanted in military, maybe a court-martial coming up. Further research would probably bring that out, but not 100% sure why he would desert and then join and serve for 26 years after that period. Fritz Braun, alias, that's his name there, that's a photograph, very large uh, portrait of him. Books and manuals, here is one that's very interesting because it is one removed from Henry O. Flipper. We don't have anything associated with Henry O. Flipper, but this is one removed from that. So what it, this is, is a non-commissioned officer and soldier's law book and regulation book uh, from 1864. And it's inscribed, Merritt Barber, 34th U.S. Infantry. Has anybody ever heard of Merritt Barber? But you've all heard of Henry O. Flipper, right? You've all heard of the trial that was against him, Fort Davis, right? This is his defense. This is the lawyer that came to the defense of Henry O. Flipper. And so he had this book early on in his career. Eventually he was transferred to the 16th Infantry, and he would serve as legal counsel for Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper during his court-martial in Fort Davis in 1881. Flipper wrote in his book, like a bolt out of the clear sky, I received a letter from Captain Merritt Barber, attorney of the 16th USI, U.S. Infantry, White, offering to come and defend me. I've never seen or heard of him before, but I accepted his offer at once, especially as I know it would cost me nothing, officers not being allowed to charge anything for defending another. Uh, the captain came to Fort Davis and actually lived with Flipper for some time while the trial was going on. Captain Marriott Bobber described his credentials this way. My opponents say, if you were to cut my throat, I would bleed acid. But others agree you have to have a heart to bleed. And I like that, I lack that particular organ. There's still so much to do with this collection. 1,600 pieces, number one, we have to catalog them. We have to photograph them. We have to further research them. Uh, we have to care for them and put them into their coffins. Uh, so there is much to do. In fact, I'm going to give you an example of the much to do because this happened just yesterday. 
we have a poncho, which is a rubberized cloth that has a slit in it, much like the ponchos that we have today, you know, in the rain, you can put it over your head into the slit. They had the same thing at that time period that usually would be issued out to the mounted soldiers and infantry soldiers would have what was considered a gum blanket, rubberized blanket, but it didn't have a slit. Now, if you wanted the slit, maybe you could deal with somebody and get theirs, buy it. That person says they lost it for some reason, you buy it off, who knows. But this one right here is one of the ponchos that has the slit. And I unrolled it for the first time and looked at it and found that there's markings on it. It's very hard to see and it's very hard to see close up too. So my intern and I spent yesterday just looking and trying to figure out exactly what it says. It's kind of hard too because it looks like that it was maybe marked out at one point. You have this black marking that's over the name and you have this black that's kind of over whatever this was supposed to be. But for some reason the company B was spared and it didn't have any markings put over it. So what we decided that it either said boil or it said boyette, it said Hanson or Hansom, I don't know, or maybe it said Ransom, Company B, and we looked at this and figured out it says 2 N C I N, 2nd North Carolina Infantry. Cross our fingers. This size of poncho is supposed to be Spanish American War era. Some of the earlier ponchos were a little bit bigger. So I automatically go to the 1890s and see if I can find any information on the 2nd North Carolina Infantry Company B. And I found it. Easy. List of officers, list of enlisted men, but nobody named this. Dang. So I kept looking and kept looking and thought, you know what, I'm just going to go and try to find anybody named this. So I'm typing in Handsome and I'm typing in Hanson. And then we look at it and say, could it be Ransom? So I type in Ransom, Boyette, and all of a sudden I found the lights come on, right? I found it. Confederate soldier. Confederate soldier of Company B, 2nd North Carolina Infantry. Uh, he was a prisoner of war two times, uh, lived through the, uh, the war, uh, was a farmer later on in his life, and for some reason we have this that might be a Spanish-American War issue, but it might be issued in the Civil War as well. So there's n further research that needs to be done on something like this. Uh, but we were very excited to be able to put a name to the object. Ransom Boyette, Company B, 2nd North Carolina Infantry. What else do we need to do? Well, as I told you, we like to have, you know, the books, the individual who wrote the book is usually the most knowledgeable on it. Well, he didn't just write books about this stuff. He also wrote books about the enlisted men and forts and some other topics. And he wrote, Doug McChristian wrote a lot of articles. In fact, that McManaman story is in an article, I think, in True West magazine. But he also wrote this book right here. It's called Regular Army O, and it's all about the enlisted men. And so it chronicles their lives from enlistment to retirement. So what are we going to do with McChristian's collection? My goal and my hope is that we create an exhibit that chronicles the enlisted men's journey from enlistment to retirement. And then in and amongst all of that information, we're going to sprinkle Douglas McChristian's collection in it. So if I've got 20 dress uniforms, if I have one place that I can put a dress uniform, I can change that out 20 times. If I have a place that I can put some field equipment, oh man, can I change that out? I can keep changing that stuff out. But we'll tell the story, hopefully, of the enlisted men from their enlistment to retirement and then utilize Douglas McChristian's collection throughout and kind of give you an idea of the stuff that they had, the stuff that they wore, the stuff that they used. I hope you're as excited as I am about this stuff. It seems like a lot of stuff and maybe you're not too excited about belts or hats but this is a one-of-a-kind collection and Fort Concho, San Angelo, Texas has it and we are very thankful and very blessed for it. Okay, time. Anybody have any questions about anything? Yes? I know you uh, were raising funds for the display cases. How did that go and how, how much were you hoping to convenience? 
very, it went very well. If you get a chance, we have some of the objects and some of the high class rare objects up in our visitor center in barracks number one right now. So the display cases that you see up front came from the donations that we got from the public. And we had one very generous donor that came up. I, I spent some time with him and talked to him about how exciting this collection is and he felt the same way. And so he gave us quite a bit to get those display cases. So using those and trying to figure out exactly how visitor flow goes and where to put exhibits and what type, we're gonna reuse them. So right now, many of the objects that are rare, one of a kinds, high class objects are up front in barracks number one, but we can use all of that stuff, including the display cases in exhibits coming up. Now, that doesn't mean that we've not come to the point we don't need money, we always need money. So if I want to put up some banners and signs and uh, some interactives in an exhibit, that's going to cost a lot of money. And I don't have any budget. I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't have a budget. So if anybody is ever interested, please call me. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Ah, it is a rare piece too because there were only about 1,300 of those made. It is a trapdoor Springfield shotgun, 20 gauge, and it's nicknamed the Forager. Forager rounds, if you've ever heard of a Forager round, into the early Springfields, it was a wooden plugged cartridge that had multiple shots inside, so it was pretty much a, a shotgun shell. But this specifically was a shotgun, 20 gauge, that uh, Springfield came out with. There was only about 1,300 made, 1,380 I think was the total number. This is number 115, so we got some of the early ones. So they manufactured them from 81, there was another group in 82, 83, and 85, and then that was it. That's all that they made. You don't see many of those. And that's the only weapon, um, you know, long arm, any kind of weapon besides, you know, a couple of blades, edged weapons that we got from Douglas. Not that he didn't collect them. But many of those pieces, the rifles, the carbines, they went up to auction for the family. So we got a lot of this stuff and that one piece and the rest of the, the weaponry, the rifles and carbines, they went to auction. It's a pretty cool piece. It's, it's in real good shape. And what they would do with those a lot of times is they were uh, parts and pieces of some of the old Springfields or some of the extra pieces. So when you look at some of those, uh, the stocks will be really bad off because they may have took that stock off of something else and put it into this to manufacture those. Yes? In your, in your slideshow, you had just two or three Civil War pieces and the rest of it is after. Yes. Did he also have a focus on earlier times or just basically late war and after? Basically, it's going to be Indian Wars era, so 66 to 1898, Spanish-American War. There's a lot of stuff in the 1890s. But there is some spillover from the Civil War. Uh, as you know, there's going to be a lot of surplus that was used in the Indian Wars era. Uh, the shell jacket over there is that pattern, 1855 cavalry shell jacket. So it's a Civil War era shell jacket. Um, we have some canteens, and we have some carrying equipment, and we have some cartridge boxes that are Civil War. But in the very early Indian Wars era, you would still see some of that being used. It seems like we do have a lot of focus, though, in the 1880s and 1890s. So there is quite a bit of Spanish-American War, and then right before that, too. But nothing really after that period. There might be a few things like this uh, winter coat was manufactured in 1901. It is the 1897 pattern, manufactured in 1901. So a little bit after that, but not much at all. Are these suspenders? Ah. This is one of the torture devices that the military thought was perfect for the military soldier to go out in the field with. So this is one of the brace systems, and this is the 1872 pattern, the first of the brace systems. They would have a 74 pattern as well, which they call the Palmer. So this would fit on your body, right? And then this bag right here, which is the 72 valise, would fit back here and hang from all this mess. You would have one strap that would go to the belt, you would have the other strap that would come to the back and attach to this bag, and you would have these rings right here that would fit with the hooks that are on the back of this bag. So that's where you'd keep a lot of your soft stuff. 
So they recommended that you keep a lot of your clothing items and your blanket and uh, your extra trousers and underwear. I have underwear over there, folks. You got to see these underwear. Biggest things I've ever seen. So you keep those soft things in there. Then on top of all this, you would have your haversack for your food items and some of your personal items. Uh, the belt may have ammunition box or boxes, but this is the torture device that they came up with. And the soldiers, it just didn't fit right. And the whole idea, especially with the Palmer one, was to balance all of the weight of everything. So if you had this big bag in the very back, you might want to put your ammunition boxes in the front. You might have your haversack that's separate. The second brace that they would have, you would have a bag hanging on this side and a bag hanging on this side and not necessarily one hanging on the back, but this specifically fit right there at the small of the back. So a lot of this is field, the stuff that you would carry with you at the field, canteen, uh, tent pieces, utensils, personal knife, and the torture device here. So it kind of made it a backpack. It kind of made it a backpack. Later in 78, they will come up with a whole new system that had a separate backpack, a separate canteen, and a separate haversack and it all just had separate straps that would fit over your body. No more of this mess. They might leave this stuff at home in the barracks whenever they go out in the field. The commander said, this is just not working. You know, their, their first sergeant, their, their lieutenant and captain, they would say, forget that stuff, just leave it, roll your stuff up in your blanket, and let's go. Yes? They did have a specific undershirt, and it was collarless. There was a, a overshirt that was the 78 pattern that was a stand-up collar, so it didn't have a fold-down collar. The 74 was really big, and I, when I wear my 74 shirt, it really rubs on me too. And then the 81 had a fold-down collar, it was a little smaller than the 74, and the 83 had a fold-down collar too. But I don't care which one it is, I always get chapped on my neck. So, yeah, if it's not a yellow handkerchief, they may have put something in there to protect their neck. Uh, if you look at soldiers from the 1850s, 1840s, and my friend over there from Fort McCavick can attest to that, um, they had leather that they would put in here, the leather stocks that you would, you know, form-fitting, make your neck stand up, it'd protect it a little bit. But they had those high uniform collars that would come up. Kind of like what you have with that shell jacket on this side. You can see how high that collar comes up. Man, that would rub pretty bad. I don't know if they suffered that bad, but when I put it on just for Christmas at Fort Concho, in three days I'm already red and hurting. So I have to put something on there to protect myself. But you may be talking about that early 70s shirt that had that big flop that came down. Anything else? Yes, sir. Is there any part of the collection that was significantly damaged? There are some that have just the minor moth damage, you know, damage to the wool. Uh, this bag right here has some damage from storage, from where the creases are, and that's why I've got it puffed up. I stuffed it so that it doesn't have a full crease. We have the Civil War knapsack. We have one of those, the soft one and it's got some damage from storage, right? Because that, that uh, rubberizing material on top of the, the, the canvas, the linen, whatever it was, sometimes that stuff will crack really bad if it's not stored correctly. When I showed the picture of that uh, poncho, that's rolled up. If I am to fold that thing up, it would be like this tissue paper right here. When you fold it, it has that crease in it, right? And that's where a lot of the damage is going to happen on that crease right there. So your answer is definitely yes, but all in all, this stuff is in really good shape. This looks like it was never issued. And some of the pieces probably were never issued at all. But others, minor damage, field use, I mean, you can tell something like that was used in the field at some point. Well, if there are no other questions, I thank you for coming out. Uh